Hello, everyone. Hello, and welcome to New America. Thank you so much for making it out tonight. Uh, uh, my name is Mary Alice McCarthy, and I direct the Center on Education and Skills here at New America. So it's my tremendous pleasure to kick off tonight's discussion. Uh, and let me start by thanking all of you for coming. So thank you for making it out. I know it's a little bit of a drizzle out there, but I know also that you'll be glad that you did. Uh, and not just because of the excellent snacks behind you, but because we've got really a, a great series of conversations teed up for this evening. So we're here tonight to talk about a very interesting and important new book. Uh, I think you saw it out there in the front. Um, and it's a book about sort of an old topic in some ways, vocational education. I should say that at least vocational education can sound old to American ears. But of course, vocational education and training is actually a very hot topic today around the world and right here in the United States. We call it career and technical education uh, here, and it is very much at the forefront of federal and state policy agendas across the country. So why is that? I think there's a lot of reasons, and we're going to hear a lot about them tonight. Uh, but underneath all of that is the fact that I think we all know that in order to achieve sustained economic growth and shared prosperity, we are going to, our communities are going to need to be able to build uh, highly educated and skilled workforces. And here in the United States over the past several decades, we have been very focused on increasing our high school graduation rates and expanding access to higher education. And we have been very successful at doing both of those things. But at the same time, we have neglected our career and technical education system, right? And I think people are really waking up these days to the fact that that is a big problem and that to really be competitive in the global economy moving forward, we will need a world-class higher education system and a world-class vocational or career and technical education system. One that includes opportunities for work-based learning and apprenticeships, and that really involves industry in the design and development of curriculum. And that's what we're focused on here at the Center on Education and Skills at New America. In fact, we are leading a multi-stakeholder initiative to expand access to apprenticeships to high school students. It's called the Partnership to Advance Youth Apprenticeship. It includes nine national partners, including some organizations for, with people that you're going to hear from today. And it's working in over 40 communities to stand up apprenticeship programs that start in high school, bridge into college, and give young people paid work experience and on-the-job training in a wide variety of industries from healthcare to advanced manufacturing to software development. And we've, as we have developed these programs and strategies, we have done our best to learn from other countries and borrow wherever we could. So of course we were thrilled to hear you know, when we learned about the book and very eager to engage with its editor and its contributing authors to help us think through what we can learn from other countries and how we might improve on their models with some of uh, our uniquely American approaches to education and training. So that's the impetus for this evening's discussion. We're going to begin with a presentation by the book's editor, Mark Tucker. I'm sure many of you are already familiar with Mark. He has a long and distinguished career in the field of vocation education, vocational education and skills policy. Mark is the President Emeritus and founder and a distinguished senior fellow at the National Center on Education and the Economy here in Washington, DC. He has served in government as the Associate Director of the National Institute of Education and later as a presidential appointee to the National Skills Standards Board uh, in the 1990s under President Clinton. He's also worked in philanthropy, founding the Carnegie Forum on Education and the Economy at the Carnegie Corporation of New York. He has been a visiting distinguished fellow at Harvard University's Graduate School of Education, and he has an extensive list of publications, and many of which are being read by graduate students uh, today as we speak, and including, but by no means limited to the book, uh, to this most recent volume and the book that is, uh, that is out front. So after Mark's presentation, we're gonna, I, uh, we will welcome uh, my boss and New America Chief Executive Officer and really Chief Intellectual Officer, Dr. Anne Marie Slaughter to the stage for a conversation with Mark about the book. Now as a political scientist uh, and former Dean of the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs at Princeton University, Anne Marie is no stranger to comparative analyses and their value for better understanding the strengths and weaknesses of our own systems here in the US. And as I'm sure many of you know, Anne Marie also served as the Director of Policy Planning for the US State Department under Secretary Clinton. So again, intimately familiar 
with the value of understanding other countries and their critical challenges. And in her spare time, Anne-Marie also manages to write books on a wide variety of topics, from gender inequality to international relations to network theory. So I think Mark and Anne-Marie are going to have a fantastic conversation. Um, I'm going to invite Mark up, but I am going to put it in right before I do that. One plug for if you'd like to follow this conversation on Twitter, we encourage you to do so, to tweet early and tweet often. And the hashtag is hashtag VET lessons. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Mark. I really like that. Chief Intellectual Officer <laughs> is, is not only a great title, it is in this case particularly apt. My heartfelt thanks to New America, to Anne Marie, and Mary Alice, and her fabulous education team for three things. One is your interest in this book, which was a long time coming. Second was sponsoring this event. And third, and very importantly for your leadership nationally on the apprentice issue, I don't care who you are, if you have a serious proposal for VET in the United States, it has got to be built on apprenticeship. And your decision to make that a keystone of your education program, I think, was a very, very important contribution of New America. Now, I'm going to try to figure out how to balance my machine in such a way that I can see the screen and it won't fall off the podium. Oops. Hmm. Okay. It's not doing anything. Why? Hmm? No, no, no. I know that. But it's not changing the slides. Is there anyone who knows how to do that? Hmm. It will not surprise any of you to learn that it did it perfectly about half an hour ago. Lord, I think so it was down for our emphasis on technology. <laughs> there, there you go. I'm not into technology. Hmm. We will be right with you. I tell you what, I won't go away. Well, I don't know. There is no clicker on the top. I have no idea what's inside. Try that. Okay, we're going to try this. Does that work? We're going to find out. Nope. Ah. Now it'll work. Why do I wish I had their genius? This, the book, is an international comparative study of, of vocational education and training in China, Singapore, Switzerland, and the United States. You may ask, by the way, why I decided to call this vocational education and training when in the United States it is called career, <coughs> career education and training. And the answer is very simple. We have a long, illustrious and foolish tradition in the United States of solving our education problems by changing the names of those problems. Mm -hmm. The rest of the world calls this vocational education and training. It's called vocational education and training there because it means something good. We changed the name in the United States because we all thought it was very low status. The only mistake we made was thinking we could change the status by changing the name. What the book is about is how you can change the status by changing vocational education and training. Okay, let's talk for a second about the United States. There is an enormous variety of vocational education and training in the United States. You can see a really good example of almost anything somewhere. The only thing you cannot see a good example of anywhere is a high-functioning system of vocational education. People come from all over the world to the United States to see our projects, our initiatives. They take the idea away, and they build a system around it. That's the part we left out. 
What this book is about is how you build first-class systems of vocational education. You will find my view of vocational education in the United States rather, as the Scotch would say, a bit dour. Or they might say, do it. And that is because, as you will see, I don't think we have a vocational education system. I don't think that's an exaggerated statement, and I will explain why. Further, we have no other system for the bottom half of our students. We have almost nothing for them. We live in an age in which, according to the people who have the most expertise on the subject, Robots and automated devices are likely to take the jobs of nearly half the people in our working population. Do you know which half that's going to be? It's the people in the bottom half of the distribution of the kids coming out of our high schools. The issue of whether we have a vocational education system worth having is actually an existential issue. If we don't solve it, we will have a very large proportion of our young adult population, either without jobs, or with jobs that pay next to nothing, or are not full-time, or all of the above. And then there will be not much left, I believe, of the United States if that happens. So I think there's a lot at stake here. <coughs> My purpose here in the next few minutes, and it will only be a few, is to give you a feeling for what I think it will take to develop a good a, a vet system as good as any in the world. Okay, here is a tiny potted history. It's a potted history of a potted history. If you go back 50 years, you go back to the 1970s, end of the 1960s, almost every economist in the world and almost every education policymaker or analyst agreed that the United States had the best educated workforce in the world. And there was a growing number of economists who believed that that fact by itself accounted for an enormous amount of our economic success and our political position in the world at large. Today, according to reanalysis by ETS of the most recent reports coming out from the OECD in Paris, the basic skills of the millennials in our workforce, when compared to the basic skills of the millennials in the workforces with which we compete, are either at the bottom of the distribution or tied for the bottom of the distribution. I put in capital issue letters down on the bottom of this slide what I take to be the central issue. It's actually really simple. Many of us, at least those with gray hair in this room, grew up in a world in which most competition in, for jobs was within the region in the state in which we lived. Today, labor at every single skill level is is a, in a international, global labor market. It is a commodity. It is a commodity on, in a global labor market. What I want you to understand, to think about, is very simple. If you look at the people in the bottom half of our workforce from an education standpoint, the least skilled, they are among the highest people, excuse me, they are among the highest cost people with those skills in the world. Global employers can go worldwide and get people with the same skills for anywhere between one one hundredth and one one thousandth of what our people in the lower half of the distribution charge for their skills. That fact by itself ought to scare us to death. Okay, let me share some comments about the high school graduates entering the first year of community college. We have a lot of data on this. The typical high school graduates entering the first year of community college cannot comprehend the texts that they are given in their first year courses those texts are written according to our national English experts at the 12th grade level. I will remind you that is a high school level. The instructors told us in the research that we have done on this, which was supervised by a panel of first class research scientists, 
The instructors told us they had to summarize the points in those textbooks in PowerPoint presentations so the kids could at least get the gist of what was in these 12th grade level textbooks. They can't do middle school math. I think all of you know that the kids coming out of high school have to take a test before they are placed, called placement tests. The majority of kids who take those placement tests are told by the community colleges that they don't have a, a mastery of mathematics sufficient to succeed in the first year math course. Those courses are called college math or they're called college algebra. They are the same course. Leading ma experts in mathematics in the United States told us that about 90% of the content of those courses is Algebra 1. That is a course in most states which is taught in middle school. What I've just told you is that these kids leave high school not ready for middle school math. We asked the people in this research study, the instructors, to send us examples of writing assignments they had given to these kids that they had graded, and we got very few back. Our research team called them to find out why. They said these kids can't write. We weren't hired to teach writing. And so we don't give them writing assignments. Our community colleges do provide, in fact, they are the principal providers of VET in the United States. The way they provide it is in units of, <laughs> what shall I say, learning. Uh, called certificate courses. That's what they take. They take certificate courses. When, you, when, they, when our community colleges speak of giving kids a credential, they give them a certificate. That certificate template basically says they have successfully concluded a two or three month preparation in the subject that they are supposed to be competent in. Hold that fact in your head because I'm about to tell you how it compares to the other parts of the world. Okay, question. Does the United States have a VET program? That's where I want to begin. The United States government, that is to say the Department of Education, regards high school students who take three VET courses in a sequence as career and technical education concentrators. That is three courses over four years, okay? A few years back, the OECD was putting together a global report on VET among the member countries and others, and it had a chart of countries and what the proportion of students in each country was that were VET students. When they got to that, they told the U.S. delegation they, they were not going to include the United States on that chart. Our delegation was aghast. They said, we have all of these VET students. These were the concentrators. And the people of the OECD said, according to our definition of vocational education, they are not vocational education students. Vocational education students take years, not months, of vocational education training, and it is set to a very high standard. That's not what you guys do. We aren't going to put it on the chart. When we use that OECD criterion, when we looked at what was going on in Maryland, we concluded that fewer than 5%, probably 2% of the kids in Maryland, which has, by the way, one of the most admired vet systems in the United States, were vocational education students by the OECD standard. The last point on this slide was the one I started with. So contrast what I just said with what we find in Singapore and Switzerland. Instead of 1%, 2%, or 3% in a serious vocational education program, in those countries you've got on the order of 60 to 70% in VET programs. Instead of being regarded as what you do if you cannot do academics, and therefore the lowest possible stream that you can be put in, it's only open to students who can do academics, as those, student, as those countries set that standard. The result of all of this is that VET has a much higher status there than in the United States, in those countries. It's not, by the way, because they changed the name. 
they didn't decide to call it career or technical education. They actually changed the status by changing the offering and opening up a world to these students of opportunities that students who can't read, can't do math, and can't write anything will never have. In Singapore, it's the kids in the bottom quarter who go into their Institute for Tec Technology Education. You said, oh my god, they stream students. Really? We discovered that the students in their bottom quarter are performing at an academic level well above the median for all American students. They just set the standard way up here. Our expectations for these kids is down here. Poor kids, they can't do it. That's not what they say. They say they can do it. And they set up a system to do it. They set up a system to do it. Their vocational education programs are not a few months. They're full time for three to five years. They are coordinated work and theory. More than half is work experience, but it's not work experience. It's very highly structured training with state-of-the-art equipment highly trained instructors. The credentials are set to a very high level. I mean, hey, look, you're comparing a credential that assumes that you've studied something for three months to a credential that assumes that you've studied it for three to five years with a very high level of technical contents. So they have credentials that mean something. The standards for those credentials are put together by the employers. So there's little doubt, but what if you earn the credential, you'll get the job. Of course you will because you've met the standards that the employers have set. The most prestigious employers in Singapore and Switzerland can't wait to get their hands on these kids because the whole system is knit, knit, to, knit together. In the United States, what we do in vocational education in our high schools is only loosely connected to what's going on in the community colleges. They're really mostly on different planets. JFF and others have worked hard to see if they can get some of what's going on in the community college to start going on in the high school and giving high school kids access to the community college program. But what you see in these other countries is much more than that. You see a program of training in VET that is three to five years long. It begins in high school and continues in the next institution, and it's knit together like this, right? It's, all, it's really all one program. So the question is, what should we be doing that we're not doing? I have two minutes. Make admission to high school vet contingent on reading at the 11th grade level. Right now it's the 7th or 8th grade level, by the way. Proficiency in Algebra 1, that's a middle school course, and writing reasonably fluently. Make high school vet the front end of community college vet in one integrated sequence curriculum. Redesign the high school community college vet program to terminate in a sequence of credentials set to standards comparable to their equivalents in Switzerland and Singapore. Make the credentials awarded at the end of community college program the qualifying credential for admission to state polytechnics and apply universities. That's what they're doing in these other countries. So you've got, you've got a system that begins in high school, moves smoothly to a to a, um, a post-secondary program that is tightly knit to it, leads directly to a polytechnic or, 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 or uh, um, um, uh, uh, what's, I'm losing my mind again, of course, structured, a, a, a science university, that's what I'm trying to say. It well, it, 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 it's called a polytechnic in Singapore, and it's called a, 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 a something else in, in, in Switzerland. It's the same institution. What it is, is an institution that takes you from a journeyman's level, in effect, using the German's way to talk about this, up into the theoretical realm to the point where you can get what amounts to a master's degree in a highly technical subject. And many of those people, by the way, actually go on for further study in, in, in postgraduate programs in major universities. The point is that you have a stream which is not 
a dead-end program for kids who can't do academics. It is easy for parents in those countries to imagine their kids starting out in vocational education and winding up running the corporation. If you want to change the status of vocational education, that's what you have to do. You have to create a governance system for VET that is largely controlled by business and by government agencies responsible for economic development. In the United States, the educators have succeeded year after year, time after time, in controlling VET, and it's not going to work. You have to charge government with involving employers in the development of state-of-the-art skill standard systems. This is a very intricate task. It is easy to set up a skill standard system that will actually rigidify an economy. Germany is not bad at doing that. It is much harder, harder to set up a skill standard system which will drive an economy forward because you cannot take average industry practice and set your standards to it. You have to take state-of-the-art practice and set your standards to it. If you do that, you can drive the entire economy forward. It's tough to do, and it will only work, as the, as the experience of both Singapore and Switzerland shows, if you have either an oligarchy in business that is determined to be state-of-the-art, which is the case in Switzerland, by the way, or as in Singapore, where you have a government agency that is willing to listen to business but has an idea about how to make Singapore even more competitive tomorrow than it was yesterday. Those things are absolutely essential. My last slide. I hear it said that one can't compare the United States with places like Singapore that are so much wealthier and less diverse than some US states. This is 130% hogwash. In 1960, when the, when the Malay Federation kicked Singapore out of the Federation and the British pulled out of the only naval yard they had there and the jobs went away, you could put all the people with a bachelor's degree in Singapore in a room half this size. Singapore was a confederation of people who spoke different languages from different countries who hated each other and fought with weapons in the streets every day. Lee Kuan Yew had an incredible challenge to build a people, a country, out of that, out of nothing. Most of the people in Singapore were illiterate. Today, it is one of the most advanced societies in the world and has arguably the best education system that has ever been built. If they can do that in 50 years, why on earth can we not build a first-class system when we actually had one, had one 50 years ago, which we've now lost? Okay? Well, let's go for it. And I also have to thank Mary Oops. Alice for her introduction. CIO generally means Chief Investment Officer yes. and sometimes Chief Information or Officer, but I love Chief Intellectual Officer. I think I'm that's gonna, great. <laughs> use that. Well, thank you. Um, I, we, fortunately, we've got lots of time to, to explore how to get there because you set up the problem very, very clearly and you had to go quickly through the, the last part. But I want to I wanna back up and ask you, when we talk about vocational education and training, and I, I love the, your point about changing the name does not change the system. It's like changing the org chart in an mm -hmm. organization yeah. rarely fixes the underlying problem. Uh, but what are the vocations that kids go into in Singapore and Switzerland or, and, or uh, other states? Because we've you know, I think many of us have vocational training. Oh, that's carpentry or plumbing or electrician. Let's, let's start with that because I think some of that may be the key to thinking about how you raise the prestige of vocational training. Some of it, as you said, is standards, and, and the, but maybe we could start there. Two answers to your question, both answers from Singapore. If you read my chapter on Singapore in the book, what you will see is that the Singapore, the, Singa the development of both education to some extent 
and certainly the economy to a great extent was, was, was driven by the plans set by the Economic Development Board. And they were, they were totally focused on economic development. Their idea was that they would develop education and training in Singapore to support the next stage of economic development. Right, so, so industrial answer, policy. The right? answer to your question, what, yes, was entirely a matter of industrial policy. So when they started out, they had nothing. And their idea was simply to attract companies looking for low-cost labor in, in, a, in, in a great port. Singapore has, as you know, a great port and yes, strategic indeed. location. So they, what they went after was, what, what, was getting enough people who could train the electricians and, and the concrete people and the plumbers to, to build the, the factory sheds that they would then lease out to these foreign companies. They, they then laddered their way up the economic development ladder and at each phase, because this is what Singapore is, ask themselves, how are we going to attract to Singapore the people who are, uh, will, uh, the, the talent that will be needed here to persuade worldwide companies that we can do the next right. higher value added thing? At each stage, they kicked out the lower value added companies they had brought in in the previous stage, right. and they brought in the higher value. When they got done with doing that, they said, oh, geez, we've attracted the top companies in the world. What's the next step? Well, the next step, obviously, is to make our own top companies yeah. in the world. And that's where Singapore is right now. And they wanted to be the regional center for telecommunications, for ship, it goes on and on. You know the story. So they, I so, think you need to speak a little louder. Is that what I'm hearing? The people in the back can hear you? But it, but no. Okay. No, okay. So, so in that case, in that case, it, 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 is, it is an economic development story, but it's very different from China until recently. Very different from China in, in, in the early stages because although they started by wanting to offer low cost, low skill labor, they did that because that's all they had. Right. Right? And they said to themselves, even from the beginning, they said to themselves, what we want to do is not make our country rich, we want to make our people rich. And they knew that the only way to do that was to build their skills. So, so but uh, you, you, had, you had another. Uh, 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 so I was asking what vocation people go into. So if you're saying, though. So, but on the status point, here's, here's the, here is the status. They reached a point where they put the money into voc ed, then they put their money into university, then they put their money basically into the academic stream in the right. schools. And then they turned around and they realized, oh my God, vocational education has become the dead end. It was exactly what it is here in the United States. This was not that long ago. So then they said, we are, what we've now got is a formula for a totally unbalanced economy, right? Everybody wants to go to university. Everybody wants to run the company. Right. Everybody wants to be a professional. There's nobody to do the work. So they, they <laughs> it's Singapore. So the, the, the premier and deputy premier themselves basically drove a process in which they reconceived vocational education in Singapore. They took a whole variety of uh, what we would regard as pretty conventional vocational education programs. They basically threw them away. They, do, they built four brand new institutions. If you visit them, these are the vocational education high schools. If you visit them, you think you're in a modern university. This was their way of saying to Singaporean parents, this government thinks that the most important thing you can do is go into vocational education. And so so let, me, let me ask you just again on that, and then I'm going to come back on Singapore generally. But So now when you go to vocational education and training, these four beautiful places, mm -hmm. what if they're not the top jobs? Because that's exactly, what are those jobs? Are they so, advanced so, manufacturing? Okay, or are so, they? So here, here's what, here's, if you go, here's what you will see. First of all, the Singaporean system is a school-based system. So, for reasons we can talk about later. So if you walk into one of those university-looking places, on the first floor you'll see shops. You'll see coffee shops, grocery stores, it goes on and on. Yeah. They're all run by students. 
They're, they're actually run on a business plan. They have to make money. So business is a vocation. So yes. So what you, if you look more broadly, here's what you see. They wanted to have a culinary program, but it's Singapore. It's not the kind of culinary program you will tip, typically see here. They went to Paul Bocuse in Paris, said design us, design us a, a culinary program worthy of the finest chefs in France. Why? Because Singapore wanted to have hotels in Singapore that world-class travelers would want to go to, right? They wanted, Singapore was building a, a, it's one of the largest ports in the world. So they, 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 have, they, have, uh, they have an oil platform business there that is one of the world's largest. Singapore is a giant factor in the oil business, even though they don't have a drop of oil. So they partnered with the companies, in, the Singaporean companies, that build these giant oil platforms, and they built what amounts to an apprenticeship program, much of which is actually cited in the schools, but it's been designed by the platform firm. They, they, have a, they have a big business of refurbishing old planes, completely redo the insides. Ireland's in that business. There are a number of other countries. They partnered with the Rolls-Royce Engine Company. So you walk into the place where they train these kids, which is in one of their schools. It's not in an aircraft right. facility. It's got a, it's, it's got a, it's got a, uh, a, a Boeing 737, not a Max, an old 737, right? And that's what the kids are working on. And, and Rolls-Royce took the engines apart and they cut them up so you can see the insides. They, in other words, they rebuilt them for teaching purposes. Right. But those kids are actually working on real Rolls-Royce engines. They're working on real Rolls-Royce airframes, the whole damn shooting match. So it's everything. It's, so it's, okay. it's, it's, it's cooking. It's, it's running a coffee shop. It's aircraft rebuilding. The whole bloody gamut. Great. So. Although, as you were talking about Singapore, I was thinking you're, you're describing industrial policy, and I'm thinking, yes, the United States doesn't have industrial policy, and then you're talking about right. you know, sort of setting different levels of economic development. We don't have, we don't have that either. Right. Uh, and of course, it's small, and, and so you're reinforcing a number of the reasons I think people say, oh yeah, well sure, that's Singapore or Switzerland. These are small countries, and they, they have very different traditions. But so I, instead of asking you sort of broadly how, how can we do this here because Singapore is special, you've actually done it. I know where you, you have designed a system for Maryland, mm -hmm. right? And I know we're going to hear from uh, the former chancellor of the University of Maryland in the next panel, Brett Kirwan. But talk to us. Let, let's cut to the chase about how you we actually, what would it look like here? And then we'll go back to sort of explore uh, some of the differences with other places, and some of, and elaborate more on what you say, think we need. Yeah, I, I actually tried to prefigure some of that, of course, in the end of my right my, my remarks earlier, and I think it, it's got it's got many parts and pieces to it. First of all, we would have Baltimore connect its career and technical education system, if you wish. Uh, very closely to the state economic development agencies and have business people in Maryland play a very important role in the design of the system, in the running of the system, in the setting the standards for the system, in providing opportunities for kids to acquire structured work experience. To go high school, community college, apprenticeship. Yes, on. yes. So all of, all of that. In order to do that, you would have to have a governance mechanism that does not now exist in Maryland, or for that matter, in hardly any other American states. And uh, the governance mechanism, uh, there are many variations on all of this that are possible, of course, but in the one that, that, that Britt and others and, and, and our team worked on, um, we, we had in mind a governance mechanism that built on uh, a, a, a body that already exists in Maryland. It's, a, it's, a, uh, it's, a, it's the governor's workforce panel. It's got very heavy representation by top business people uh, in many different lines of work, uh, business in, in Maryland. It also has, uh, it's basically run by the Department of Labor 
it, it's it's and, and workforce development. So it's it's got the economic development perspective, the labor force perspective, and the employer perspective. You've got to speak loudly. Yes, the, the educators would have a role in that certainly, but right now. Um, the actors I've just been talking about are on the outside looking in. They would, in fact, have a have a very important role. That's number number one. Second, y you would need to have. Y y y you are quite right. The United States. It's really interesting. The United States says volubly, year after year after year, industrial development. No, go and talk to a governor. Well, and okay. you will you will <laughs> discover pretty damn fast that it's hard to tell the difference between Republicans and Democrats. Republicans know that the that their the people who are going to go to vote are going to look at their state of economic development in their state. If it's going well, they'll they will credit the governor. If it's going badly, they will blame him or her, whether that was fair or not. They have a big interest, and in, 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 it's especially true in states like mine in Maine. They know that they can't be good in everything. And, and so many of them, I think, have a predisposition to think, yeah, it would be nice to be hands off and say, you know, we'll support anything and everything, and, 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 and we can't have an industrial policy. But in point of fact, in every state, there are industries that, that form the backbone of that state's economy. And, and so it's, it becomes an, a, a, a technical and political matter to start figuring out how you can support those industries by creating research and development laboratories yeah. in the universities. There's all, you know what this list is, right? One of the things on that list is building a very uh, capable workforce. It, it, that process has to get married to these other pieces, okay. right? So, <laughs> so yes, so no industrial policy, but we have economic development strategies. You bet. That's and right. to have economic development strategies, then yes, you need to engage the employers. Mm -hmm. But here, let's let's. Well, it's more. Let's, than, it's, it's more than that. It, if it, the state has a choice to make, it's the same choice that Singapore had to make. Are the, are the you can't have a system to produce very high levels of technical competence unless you have workplaces where kids can, can acquire that competence. So the only question is, where are those workplaces? Are they going to be in business? Or are they going to be in schools? Or are they going to be in a combination? The, the employers have to be a part of that decision. They have to put together the standards. So even if the places are in schools, the work, the design of the work and the training has to be in the hands of the employers largely, because if it isn't, they aren't going to trust the output. Right? Okay. So I don't care whether it ends up being a school-based system or a work employer-based system. The employers and, and the government have to drive it. Now, there's one other big question there, which is, do you really mean, Mark, what, do, what, what did you just say about government? Shouldn't just the employers drive it? My answer to that would be no. And, 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 and this take just a second to explain this, but there's an enormous difference among the states in the United States. There are many states in the United States which are in a low-skill equilibrium. That, the most important businesses in the states are businesses that would go out of business if they couldn't keep wages very low. They don't care about raising skills. In fact, they're worried about raising skills because if the state raises the skills, either their employers will ask for their employees will ask for more money, or they will go so out of state. But, right? But those are the jobs that will get automated mostly. Yes, but by the time that happens, those kids are going to be in no, terrible agreed. shape because they have no skills. So if you go to the employers in low-skill equilibrium states and you say, "What kind of training do you want? I want people who will show up in time." do what they're told, and be able to read and write at a low level. Thank you, I will take care of the rest. A high-skill equilibrium state is an entirely different thing, right? High-skill equilibrium state is selling high-value-added products and services. They die if they don't get highly qualified people. They're willing to pay them a lot. It's a totally different way of thinking. So in a high-skill equilibrium state, you can go to employers and get pretty good answers about how to get in an even better economy. In a low-skill equilibrium state, it's not worth getting out of bed. It's not going to happen. So 
It, even in Singapore, which is now uh, among the most high scale equilibrium places in the world, the, the, the Economic Development Board gets the advice of employers about what the standards ought to be, but it doesn't say, oh, okay, that's what we're gonna do, because the, the government says, our next big step is going to be going into this business in a big way. So I right. hear opposition, uh, so not opposition, obstacles to overcome, so role of the government and getting employers involved. But let me, let's, let me grasp the nettle that I hear mm -hmm. as someone who was in school at very elite institutions till I was 30. So I'm just gonna own mm -hmm. that right up front. And yeah. I, one of them was, I went to Princeton and I still live there and I'm emerita professor. And as you are saying, employers involved, every fiber in my being, is as liberal arts education. Princeton is the sort of absolute epitome of it. Princeton doesn't even want you to take an, well, you can take an economics course, but God forbid you should have pre-law or pre-business or pre-anything vocational, right? You're supposed to be studying ancient music or, or you know, things that will open your mind. And I'm well aware, because I have been the head of New America for seven years and I know that only 14% of Americans go to four-year residential colleges, a fact I tell people around the country, and people are shocked. But the problem, it's not so, okay, it's not Princeton. It's this image of prestige education is education that is affirmatively divorced from ever thinking about getting a job. Right. So how do we tackle that? Okay, so um, my degree from Brown University <laughs> It is, With no, no core curriculum whatsoever at this point. That was not the case, by I the know, way, when I, I was just there. Talked to someone. But, but, my, but my degree was in philosophy and literature, right? Right. So what, 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 what we said to the Maryland Commission was we see a world that looks like this. It looks to us as though the bonds that used to exist between especially large corporations and their employees are largely broken. And they're, and they're broken both ways. There's much less allegiance by employees to the employer. There's much less yes, allegiance absolutely. by the employer to the employees. This is leading many corporations to reduce the rather meager amounts they were investing yes. in employee training, except in very, very high need companies like Google, right? So, that's creating a world in which more and more people are gig employees. They're, they're serving many masters at the same time, and those masters are changing, and what they want is changing. So we've said to the states, if you ask the companies what they want right now, they're gonna tell you, we want somebody who has a high degree of technical competence that fits today's needs, right? right? Boom, we, if, if, we have to, if we have to train them once they're there, we're gonna look twice unless we're nearly desperate. Right. Right? What, we've, what we said to the folks in Maryland was, you have to do, uh, we're now in a point where we have to do two things at the same time. We do have to prepare kids the way they are prepared in Singapore and in Switzerland. That is to say, to, to end up coming out of the process with a very high level of skill in a particular narrow area. Right. This is one part of the T. Okay. But the other part is the part you were talking about. Because what these young people are gonna find is what I was describing a moment ago. The jobs aren't gonna last long. Right. The next one isn't gonna look like the one you're gonna do now. You may actually be having to work in several different fields at once. You, what you're gonna have to offer an employer is precisely that. That is your flexibility, your, knowledge, your ability to take what you know over here and apply it over there. That is going to take precisely the opposite of the bar of the T I was just describing. It's going to take what you and I experienced at Princeton and Brown. It's going to take a deep, broad education. We're going to have to actually do liberal education, right? I As the, part of vocational and edu education. My effect. general view, to, for what it's worth, is that what we're gonna see is that vocational education is gonna look more like what we think of as a liberal arts education in a university, and at the same time, the liberal arts education is gonna look more like the best vocational education. What we're seeing in Europe now 
is that more and more kids who went to gymnasium and expected to go to a good university are finishing gymnasium, but before they go to university, they're picking up a credential out of, at a high level out of the vocational education mm -hmm. system. I think that's the future, and I also think that vocational education is not going to be it's not going to be a three-month certificate course in a community college. I think those days, we'll see what well, happens And to the that. one example we can point to, of course, is coding, right? I mean, at this mm -hmm. point, right. Um, right. I think it's extraordinary. At Stanford, it's everybody. But even, everybody. even at, right. for instance, 70% of people take some computer science. Mm -hmm. And even those folks who are never going to do it understand right. they have to know it. But more and more That's kids right. are actually learning to code, which, which is true. I'm mindful of our time, but we've talked about government, we've talked about employers, we've talked about and the, I, you know, the, this tension about what prestige education is, of course, is also makes it very difficult to get the employers onto, mm -hmm. you, you said it's a workforce board, not an educational board, and indeed Barry Alice is the only person I've ever met who's worked in the labor department and the ed department. <laughs> That's a very rare, rare very thing. Very few people have done that. Yes, um, but the other, the other obstacle I think we see, and you've written about in your book, are parents. Mm -hmm. right? And parents, of course, are responding to these general signals about what prestige is. But you wrote, and I think this is so right, that manufacturing work, which if we were looking at it from the point of view of the, you know, the golden age of companies and good jobs, manu unionized manufacturing jobs were very good jobs, but you say the three Ds, that parents see these jobs as dirty, dangerous and dull and a fourth or demeaning mm -hmm. and th those right. dirty dangerous and dull is pretty pretty demeaning so how do we how do we tackle that and I'll, I'll add that I was just at the California Future of Work Commission I talked to the Future of Work Commission and there was somebody there talking about additive manufacturing the newest the way we now talk about 3d manufacturing and she essentially described a kind of manufacturing that was a very white collar job in traditional categories. So, how, but how do we, you know, sort of change that image of what manufacturing is and how parents should think about the larger question of, of vocational edu and educational training? About three days ago, I was on my computer and I was watching. Um, of about a five-minute video that was put together by Bloomberg. Ah. They, were showing, they were showing a factory in Guangzhou. Yeah. Um, they, had, they had video from the same factory that about, from about five years ago. The pictures from the same factory about five years ago showed you this great big open hall full of people working on various machines, turning out whatever the hell this stuff was. In the second video, it showed the same hall, full of robots. Mm. There was exactly one person in that factory. And then they made the point that you just made. This doesn't, if you look at American farming, it now employs 5% of the people that it employed about 100 years ago. Right. Those, those, those jobs. Those, are so the Japanese are now turning out tractors that don't need a human driver. They are programmed by the farmer who was sitting in an office in his farm, right? That farmer has to be able to program computers because John Deere is trying to sell them computers that they can't get into, and it's costing them a bloody fortune. And they figure if they can, if they can fix the damn thing themselves, oh. they, they're going to be able to make a pro. <laughs> they, those computers and those machines figure out Meter by meter, how much water, yep. which fertilizer, how much, which insecticide, how much, what the contours ought to be, right. while the farmer is working the international commodity markets to figure out where he should be investing to hedge his American crops. That often takes a doctorate, right? The same thing is, is happening in our factories, basically. It's not that that one person there is the factory. No, 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 no. Where did all those robots come from? Right. Who programmed them? Right? It goes on and on. How do, who fixes them? All those jobs, you're right. We have thought of as, as white collar jobs. They are white collar jobs. But they're Not manufacturing all of them. jobs. They're, they're manufacturing jobs, yes. 
But, and this was the point I started with tonight, the people who are coming out of our high schools now are a million miles away from being able to get those jobs. Okay. Um, <laughs> so let me, let me end with the final question. Um, so you, you, and you've talked about all the different pieces, the joining up, and this, that to me is hugely important to think about uh, you know, how high school joins to community college, to, then mm -hmm. to workforce, uh, and to, right. uh, to continuing education, whether, however we describe it. Um, but you, you actually also talk about skill standards. Mm -hmm. And you say, right. you, you ha to be able to do this, we have to have different ways of credentialing. Yeah. And that means we've got to be That's able, right. if I understand a skill standard, is to be able to say, he, you are able to do this at this standard. So, but talk about what they are, why they're important, how we get there. Okay, let's, let's begin with yeah, what they are and, 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 and how you get there. Skill standards in this context simply means the person who is in this program needs to wind up with a certificate that certifies that they know this and can do that. Right. Okay? So the skill standard spells out what the this and the that are. Okay, so why is it important to have this? Because if you have a set of skill standards, it communicates to the student what the student has to know and be able to do to get the job they are after, one. It communicates to the training organization in our country, a community college, what the curriculum needs to be in order to give kids this, the, a chance of actually acquiring the credential they want. It signals to the employer, if they actually get those credentials because they've met those criteria, that the person applying for the job actually has the skills they want. None of these things are true now. So a community college can go out there and say, oh, yeah, we have an advisory committee, and I'll go and talk to the members of the advisory committee, and yeah, we, want, we, we meet once a year, and we have a nice time for an hour. The, the community college is putting together a program that its, that it's staff wants to teach. <laughs> That's what happens. I've never heard of such a thing, professors teaching what they want to teach. First, that never happened. The first country that I went to that had, a, that had a skill standard system that I thought was pretty damn good, a lot better than the German one, by the way, was Denmark. And in Denmark, the equivalent institution to our community colleges is run by the mayor. The people who sit on the board are the heads of the, of the companies hmm. from the principal businesses in town and the heads of the unions of the, of the people who labor there. The skill standards are negotiated at the, at the national level, industry, labor, governments managing the process. Unlike Germany, which set a skill standard and then left it alone for eight to 10 years, they had a system set up so that at the local level, what I'm just describing, the community college level, if the community college employers, mayor, labor came to them and said, we are now involved in a new industry that has these needs. We need an exception to the rules because this is going to make us more competitive. If they could make that argument stick, they would not only allow them to do that, they would then and there consider changing the national skill standard, not waiting in eight to 10 years. So what I've said to you, I think, are two important things. One is who is running the show. Our community colleges are basically run by the educators. This is the comparable institutions in these other countries. It's much more complicated than that. In, in Singapore, they are run by the vocational educators, but the people who have been planted in the key positions are most of them from the Economic Development Board. All right. So. Mark Tucker, thank you. I will tell everybody, since I, I have a blurb on the back of the book, uh, it is an excellent book. And it really, it, it both gives you wonderful knowledge around the world, but it does actually convince you in the end that there is no special magic in Germany or Singapore or Switzerland right. that the United States can't do. And we frankly need that right. kind of reminding. So I urge you to read the book. And I thank you for kicking off this conversation. I thank you for your You're support. Welcome. Thank you very much.
Okay, well, thank you again to, to Mark and Anne Marie, who's just stepped out. Um, my name is Taylor White. I'm a senior policy analyst here at New America. I work on our pre K 12 team and work across that team in our Center for Education and Skills at New America. Um, and in this role, I lead a lot of our work for the Partnership to Advance Youth Apprenticeship, which Mary Alice referenced earlier. Um, through PIA, we're working with a number of communities, dozens of communities actually across the country who are working to try to implement a number of the elements that Mark laid out as um, sort of the gold standard for what he'd like to see in CTE and vocational systems here in the US. Um, you know, the pathways that connect high school and community college and bachelor's degrees um, into seamless pathways for students um, and pathways that also include a significant portion of students' time in work-based learning settings through youth apprenticeship. Um, there are a number of others as well, but those are two that we see gaining, gaining a lot of steam in the work that we do. Um, and I will say that the work through PIA has given us a bit more optimism, I would say, about the state of the US CTE system, and in particular, the commitment of educators, policymakers, system leaders, and even business to, to a growing extent to find a better way forward for students for whom this is uh, a destination. So I think that, you know, I, I'm, I'm absolutely willing to concede that we have this issue where we love programs and we're a little bit less comfortable with systems development, but I think books like this one um, in international comparative work generally are hugely helpful in providing examples for us and setting a high bar for what's possible if, if we really are willing to work together to grow these systems. So for that reason, we're very excited to be involved in this event today. Um, and we are very pleased to have some of the chapter authors with us to serve on a panel in just a moment as well as um, two additional people who are working in two very different roles to improve CTE systems and education systems in this country more broadly. Um, so I am very pleased to announce the folks. Um, I will read your bios first, and then you can come up and storm the stage and take your seats. Um, but but um, joining us tonight for this panel, uh, we have um, Dr. William Britt Kerwin, who is the chair of the Maryland Commission on Innovation and Excellence in Education. Dr. Kerwin is the Chancellor Emeritus of the University System of Maryland, a position he held for more than a decade. Prior to that role, he was the 26th president of the University of Maryland College Park and the 12th president of The Ohio State University. Kerwin has served in multiple roles at the College Park campus, including as a professor, chair of the Department of Mathematics, we would have never met when I was a student anywhere, um, <clears throat> vice chancellor for academic affairs and an acting chancellor. He's chaired many boards and commissions, including the Knight Commission on Intercollegiate Athletics, the National Research Council Board of Higher Education in the Workforce, the American Council for Higher Education, uh, the Association of the Public and Land Grant Universities and the Business Higher Education Forum. In 2016, Governor Larry Hogan appointed Dr. Kerwin to chair the Commission on Innovation and Excellence in Education, which you may recognize as the Kerwin Commission. Next up, we have Nancy Hoffman, who is a senior advisor at Jobs for the Future and an author of two chapters uh, in the Vocational Education and Training for a Global Economy book that we are talking about tonight. Hoffman is co-founder co of the Pathways to Prosperity Network, uh, through which she supports states, regions, and cities in efforts to build or improve pathways from high school to a, to a uh, first marketable post-secondary credential. Hoffman has held faculty and administrati administrative positions at institutions including MIT, UMass Boston, Harvard, Brown, Temple, and Portland State. Um, and she serves on the Massachusetts Board of Higher Ed and the boards of the North Bennett Street School and Build Up Birmingham. She has also written and edited numerous books uh, and is co-editor of Harvard Education Press's new Work in Learning book series. Also joining us tonight uh, is one of our, our partners in the Partnership to Advance Youth Apprenticeship, Janae McLaren, who is a program manager with the National Alliance for Partnerships in Equity. Um, she is the program manager specifically for the Southeast region of the US and has spent over two decades working in the fields of service, education, and youth development. Janae began her career as a law enforcement officer in Arkansas. I didn't know that, Janae. <laughs> Serving as a community resource officer and later as a corporal for the state Capitol Police. She was later dean of students for the Kent School District in Washington State before transitioning to the nonprofit sector. Um, and let's see, she worked uh, serving as the director of Impact for a City Year in Seattle where she oversaw the implementation of programs focusing on service learning, student achievement, and increasing graduation rates. And last but by no means least, we have Ms. Vivian Stewart who is a senior advisor for education at the Asia Society and again an author of chapters um, in the book that we are, we are celebrating here tonight. Um, 
before her role at the Asia Society, uh, Vivian was uh, vice president for education at the Asia, Asia Society, where she was responsible for its programs that promote the study of Asia in other world regions, cultures, languages, and global issues in US school, and for building connections between US and Asian education leaders. Um, in the role, she developed a series of international benchmarking exchanges to share expertise between American and Asian education, business, and policy leaders on how to improve education to meet the demands of globalization. She has a number of other accomplishments here that I'm unfortunately going to truncate, but I will tell you that she, her book, A World Class Education, Learning from International Models of Excellence and Innovation, was named one of Bill Gates' top 10 books for 2012. So please join me on stage and we can get the conversation started. I think our names. Oh, there's the book. Okay, so thank you again for joining us here tonight. Um, I, I want to get the conversation started, I guess, by sort of regrounding us in the conversation around USCTE, or VET, if you will. Um, and I know that, Nancy, you and um, your husband, Bob, uh, contributed the chapter in the book that's on the US system. So I'm wondering if you could get us started um, with a sort of response to the overview that Mark, Mark's provided, and in particular to his prescriptions for improving the system moving forward. So it will be no great surprise to Mark that I don't have quite as dim a view <laughs> about either the systems or the capacities of, of the young people who are in them or of community college students, but never mind, we'll move on from there. Uh, I think in, in terms of the overview, though, it, it, is, it, ha it has some holes, but I don't think it's entirely off base. Um, I do think there's something that we should be thinking about, and that is do we need a federal system? We have a number of states that have very strong systems. I happen to come from Massachusetts, which has a remarkable vocational education system, probably 25 institutions serving about 20% of high school students. They're standalone schools. Uh, the unfortunate part right now is there are waiting lists of about 3,000 students, and uh, these schools which are wonderful at launching people into careers as well as into post-secondary education are now overrun and becoming more the, the province of the elite because, uh, to answer part of the question that Anne-Marie was asking, they don't just teach carpentry and uh, HVAC and elect electrical, although that's important. They teach veterinary science, they teach IT, they run businesses that get people out into the labor market. So Tennessee, I would say, has a good system. Delaware has developed a very good system. I would be perfectly happy if we had 50 different systems, but that they were systems. So on the systems piece, I certainly agree with Mark's overview. I think it's also worth noting that uh, something else, which is that Massachusetts is about 6.5 million people. Switzerland is about 8.5 million. So we're, when we're comparing the US mm -hmm. to other countries, we need to really take a deep breath because uh, the breadth of difference in the United States is different from a place like Singapore particularly where there's a very high concentration mm -hmm. of, of population. Sure. To move on to the prescription, um, I think anyone who's thought about VET or CTE would agree that there that we really need to have employers engaged and that the culture in this country has not been uh, to engage, it's really been to say this is, the, this is the province of schools. Up until fairly recently, most of our em, uh, employer-based skills development has gone to middle managers and above. And I'm going to say a word about that before I, I jump off here. Um, but. I think there's a, a difference in the way I would explain, particularly what Switzerland does, and the way we talk loosely about employer engagement. And I think it's a kind of important nuance that a lot of people miss, mm -hmm. which is that in the Swiss system, the standards, the 250, 235, um, actually 235 um, career qualifications, that, that's the whole range from violin making to retail to banking. Um, 
those standards are developed, first of all, by employer associations. And there's a big difference between saying employer and employer associations. Because associations, for example, uh, the associations in Switzerland that manages all of the manufacturing knows that there are differences among companies. But the goal, and this is the government's role, is to keep the skills training broad enough so that the person being trained owns the skills and can sell them in the marketplace. And in fact, that's what happens. About 30 to 50% of young people in Switzerland who complete a, an apprenticeship don't stay in the place where they were trained. They go elsewhere. And this is a really healthy phenomenon because one industry says, we have this culture. The young person goes to another culture and brings their knowledge and their questions with them. So I think that's an important distinction. And I know Mark knows this, but I think it's when we talk about building a system here, it should, it, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't assume that we're going to go employer by employer. Um, so I think that there are some other things, though, that I would say about the prescription. It might surprise people, although Mark and Anne-Marie were going in this direction. I don't think that there should be a separate CTE system. And um, I th the work that we do with Pathways to Prosperity is to develop career-focused education with the notion that you know we take six-year-olds to the firehouse and to the grocery store to see how work goes on. But once students are in middle school and high school, all that disappears. <coughs> So I, we, I, our point of view is that we need a system which is career focused for everyone, whether you're getting a PhD and want to be a research scientist, you certainly want a career or an associate's degree. Um, I actually once tried to figure out how we deal with this binary of academic and, and, and career, and the best I could come up with was cracademics, and we decided that <laughs> that wasn't going to work. <laughs> so. So that's one thing. Um, the second thing is there, there are really big gaps in, in uh, the way we prepare young people for the labor market. One of them is ex work-based learning experience. The second one is really um, that we, and I think Mark is going here too, we, I think our system is really misaligned and structured in an unfortunate way for what we really need. What's so striking in, in Switzerland is that 16 young people begin to do real work. They're not cynical, they haven't failed, they're treated like adults, and they thrive both emotionally, socially, and technically in the labor market. And so here we are trying to make two systems which are misaligned, high school and community college fit together. The final thing I would say, though, is again a, a correction to, to at least Mark's view of community colleges. Um, in Massachusetts, to go back there, CTE, there's no word CTE in post-secondary, but the assumption is that when you go to a community college, you want to get a career, and if you're going to transfer, you may be told, well, you need to take this course in biotech, not those five courses, but we are very careful to set up all the general education, so it's included in the career, uh, in the career program. And um, there are relatively few short-term programs. If you're going to be in any of the allied health fields, those are two-year programs with clinical uh, experiences built in. So it's not quite as, as uh, slipshod as Mark may have, may have said, you, said uh, may, may have given you the impression that it is. And the final thing that, that I would say is that um, there's something going on in the country right now which I don't quite know what to make, I, make of, but that is, you probably know Starbucks, for example, is offering, uh, f in partnership with ASU, a full bachelor's degree. And that's only one among many companies that are all of a sudden seeming to right. be creating these uh, opportunities for incumbent workers and to attract workers. Whether that's going to have a real impact on our current CTE system, I don't know. But as we look around and we think about learn and earn, something very interesting is taking place in the U.S. economy. And I think we need to keep an eye on it because as often in the U.S., there are little seeds of things popping up that may turn into uh, a quite powerful innovation. Mm -hmm.
particularly if we have a system that's there to catch it and put its arms around it right. and, and stand it up and make it sustainable. Yeah, I mean, I just came away from the JFF office where we were brainstorming about how do you map this landscape. Yep. Some of these things are much better than other things. Sure. Some of them give you a choice. Some of them are outskilling you, so we'll train you, but then get rid of you. Right, right. But, uh, which is what Amazon is doing, but actually better than getting rid of you without training you. Uh, right. So I would say we're, we're in the midst of some small but promising sure. and interesting commitment of employers to work to in education. Work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I mean I think we see that too. Certainly through through Paya and our work there. Um, but I, I am interested in this distinction that you've made and Mark made, and we're going to keep coming back to the programs versus systems piece. Um, Dr. Kerwin, in, in Maryland, you've right. recently led an effort to not set up a whole bunch of programs and kind of let a thousand flowers bloom and right. see what works, but you've been working with a, a large group of people to redesign a system and really rethink right. it from the ground up, borrowing significantly from international models and trying to glean, you know, take lessons that you can bring back to build a system, not, right. uh, not a bunch of programs, and maybe a system that can support some of the employer engagement that Nancy's referencing here. Can you share with us a little bit about the changes the commission's recommended, particularly um, with regards to CTE right. and why? Um, and maybe you know, how that vision was influenced by the time that you spent looking at international systems? Right, well, um, it's, it's a little hard to describe our CTE. in a nutshell. Yeah, I, know, I understand. <laughs> I know. Uh, our, our CTE system without speaking uh, for a moment more broadly sure, about what please. the commission has done because the, p the pieces all fit, fit together. And so uh, I'll try to encapsulate uh, three years of work in a few minutes. Uh, but uh, what happened in 2016 is that the uh, governor of the state, the General Assembly, created this commission uh, and asked it to uh, develop policies and practices and a funding formula so that Maryland schools would perform at the level of the best performing schools in the world, uh, an audacious uh, charge. And um, in, in, in a weak moment, uh, I came out of retirement to take on the <laughs> most difficult job I have ever uh, 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 undertaken in my life. And, and so uh, the first thing the commission had to do was understand where is our Maryland schools. And it was uh, very troubling to find out uh, where they were. Basically, uh, Maryland student performance on assessment scores is very much in the middle of the pack in the country. And we all know the country is at best in the middle of the pack in the world. So the idea of getting Maryland from where it is to the top performing schools is, was a daunting challenge. We also saw we had huge funding inequity uh, issues in the state. We had uh, tremendous teacher uh, uh, attrition. And so it was not a pretty picture. Um, and suddenly we're left to, you know, how are we going to make our schools as, as good as the best? And uh, one of the good things that came into my life, I learned about Mark Tucker and NCEE, who spent the last 20 years. Uh, studying the elements of high-performing, uh, creating the building blocks for high-performing systems. So we brought Mark on as a consultant and worked very closely with him and uh, basically did for two years an intense uh, study of where Maryland is in relation to the NCE building blocks and where the high performers are. And out of that came five major policy recommendations, and I'll get to the CTE in just a second. The first is a major investment in early childhood education and uh, early childhood care so that many more kids come to kindergarten ready to learn. Secondly, rethink teaching as a profession. Make it a high status profession. As they have done, I mean, there isn't a high performing school system in the world where teaching isn't seen as a high status. If we don't do that in Maryland and across the country, we can forget ever matching uh, uh, th these other schools. Uh, Create a curriculum that is benchmarked against uh, the best performers in the world. Address the uh, equity funding issues. And finally, to build a credible accountability system for the investment that would uh, be required to make all this happen. So going back to the curriculum uh, uh, for, for just a moment, uh, what the commission recommended or has recommended to the state is that we significantly elevate our pathetic college and career ready standards. Right now, Maryland College and Career Ready standard is that you can read at the 10th grade level and do Algebra 1. And uh, here's, the, here's the shocking statistic. Fewer than 40% of high school graduates this past year met that standard. Now think about that. That should worry everybody. And believe me, 
If you think Maryland's special in this regard, forget it. You look across the country, you're going to find exactly uh, the same, same thing. So um, uh, what we did is uh, we want to raise this college and career, uh, we raised the college and career ready standard, uh, we recommend it. So it is that uh, you reach the college and career ready standard if you can take a college level course without remediation. That is the standard that we've set in, in Maryland. And what our, the, the commission has uh, proposed is that we uh, set as a goal that kids reach that standard by the 10th grade. And then in the 11th and 12th grade, they take advanced placement or international baccalaureate. That would be one pathway. Another pathway is early college. Mm -hmm. And they could end up with credits or a, a college degree. A third pathway would be a rigorous career and technical education or a VET, prog uh, vet program. Now, keep in mind, the kids in that pathway have already met the career and college, uh, uh, the college and career ready standards. So this is not a pathway for underperforming students. These are kids who've achieved uh, the, the skills that they are ready to take uh, credit bearing courses in, 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 in college. So now with, the, with, the, uh, with that pathway, uh, what we de uh, decided to do, and uh, Mark was very influential at this, is take the control, the, the oversight of that, out of the sole possession of the Department of Education. So we created a partnership with the trades, trade associations, the private sector, and education. That is the standards board that will have to uh, develop and approve the curricula and uh, the credentials. And, and the goal is that then um, the, uh, th this pathway will lead to an industry recognized uh, certification or will articulate uh, to a community college if there is some additional uh, uh, training uh, required uh, for, for that. Um, what's interesting is that uh, how popular this is. Um, uh, th there was a, a poll recently in the state uh, incidentally, as you can imagine, the commission's recommendations have gotten a lot of attention in the state and in the newspapers. But there was a poll about the various, the five policy uh -huh. areas. They all were overwhelmingly endorsed in the state. But the number one most popular path uh, recommendation in the state was the CTE mm -hmm. recommendation. So it tells me, and I, I want to agree with you, that I think something is changing in the country. Look, people already question, is college worth it? Mm -hmm. You hear that all the time. And uh, so I, I, there's a hunger out there for um, uh, a, a pathway for kids what, the, where they, they, they get a good education, but then they have a skill that they can go into the workforce. So, workforce. so, so our goal in Maryland is to get 40% of our high school completers into this, uh, th th this, uh, this pathway. The CTE pathway. So, that, so those students would be finishing 10th grade, they would meet a college and career readiness right. benchmark. Presumably the plan has every student meeting right. that benchmark, right. and then they can go in one of three directions. It's one of three directions, and, and the, they would be, there would be um, uh, 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 different models. There could be in-school in um, career and technical education or vet training, but we put a tremendous amount of in emphasis on apprenticeship. I'm so we're to trying Peter. to build our program around the notion of apprenticeships for all sorts of reasons. But uh, we can go into that. Yeah. Uh, I just that spent later. a week um, with, the, with a woman from the Maryland Department of Education in Germany, and she's taking everything back with her. So yeah. I, I, I can confirm that that's really happening. <laughs> um, but so I'm curious, this idea that you'll have, it, it, so, it sounds like the plan is, is predicated to some extent on this expectation that all students will be able to meet that um, right. college and career readiness benchmark in 10th grade, which is, which is um, hugely ambitious. It's absolutely the well, goal we should be setting for students, but it's, it's it, a tough goal to reach. Well, so, we, we acknowledge that not all students will. So sure. we're, 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 our uh, estimate, our project, uh, projection is, this is a 10-year implementation plan that we have. And is by, by the year 10, our goal is to have 80% of kids meeting the college and career ready standard by the 10th grade. By the 10th grade. So then what happens to those kids who don't? Well, they're gonna have special support uh, and, and tutoring and help so that by the time they graduate, they will have met the college, at least a significant fraction of them would meet that standard. And while they're doing that, they could take some uh, career and technical education. Uh, 
education, education courses. courses. Yeah. Okay, neat. Well, thank you for that clarification. Sure. I'm gonna. I, I'm curious to see hear what Janae, our, our panelist at the end, thinks of that. Janae's organization, National Alliance for Partnerships and Equity, is laser focused on working with education institutions and systems and educators, even frontline educators, um, especially in CTE programs, to ensure it, to build programmatic capacity to increase access and, and make sure that programs are serving students equitably. And certainly, this idea that 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 over 10 years students would be meeting this benchmark is ambitious, and it is a goal we should be setting for our kids. I'm wondering if you have um, reactions to the plan or thoughts or even advice that you might offer the state of Maryland as they think about working to create these programs and ensure that they're really they're really providing equitable opportunities for students who may not be meeting that benchmark um, at the sure. 10th grade year or 11th grade year or, or even beyond. So before I address that particularly I just wanted to say a couple of things that I had heard that coming from the practitioner part of being with the students and working with the students it's a different perspective than those who are at the top down building the systems because when you're on the ground trying to implement them, it's easy for people who have studied it and said this is what you do, but when you're actually dealing with those students, yeah. that is a different scenario. So having worked in a school where those students are quote unquote the, the bottom line, the end result of all these great thoughts, the practical application of that really happening makes me cringe a little. And when I hear things, um, and it's Again, having read the book, and I do see all the value that's there, being able to look at some of the systems that are in place. Here in the United States, we're coming from a deficit of how we already have our education system set up and how it's not the most equitable environment that we're in. And the thought that even though China can move street sweepers to another level, we still have some unconscious bias that we look at certain populations and we don't see them moving into that level. So when we start talking about that we're going to get students to point A to point B, even in a tenure, is ambition, and I'm not knocking anyone's ambition. But I just like for us to, to stay grounded in, in equity and looking at it through that lens, because when we work with our state institutions and agencies, one of the things they say to us is, we're not getting enough people in the programs, or, or what tips can you give us, or what are the best practices? And the best practices and tips don't work if we're not changing our mindset if we're still using unconscious bias as our lens for thinking of who belongs in those chairs. And so when we talk to the gatekeepers, whether that's the administrators, whether that's the counselors, whether that's the admissions officers, it even goes back to that ninth grade counselor who sees that student for the first time and makes an assumption that you belong over here or you belong over there. I have to say, I was the biggest disappointment in sixth grade because I'm not a basketball player. And teachers saw my height and they're like, oh, there you go. I was like, I can't make a basket. You put her in front of me. <laughs> but the assumption was that that's what I wanted to do. I had no desire to do sports. I wanted to do something else. But because we have preconceived notions of what our students are going to be, when we're making decisions about how to deal with our students, we have to keep them at the forefront and we have to keep equity at the forefront. So I would be interested if I could give advice to Maryland is what are your thoughts and planning on how you're going to get students just up to the level. Having saw that we have students who are not meeting fourth grade reading and writing and math, that's startling enough. And that's every student in the United yeah. States. We spent a, a time where it was a teach to test model and we're still reeling from that teach to test model. Then we spent a time saying culturally everyone must go to college. So again, I heard it mentioned about parents, and parents are another factor that we don't consider because in many comp in cultures that we don't think about, going to college is the pinnacle. So I would love for someone to sit and tell an African-American family who's worked really hard to get their student to college ready to say, no, 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 I want you to go back and work in manufacturing, even if manufacturing has changed. So it's a lot of factors that we haven't considered. And so when I read the book and looked at it, I was like, these are all great. I think it's wonderful. And the biggest one that popped up was the partner of working with industry. Because again, as we train people, and they say we want more people involved, but this hand is open to say give, but they're not giving anything in return, whether that's funding for training, whether that's opportunity to come in and talk to the students about real world experience. And working with PIA and the whole apprenticeship program has definitely opened up my eyes as far as where we need to go because there is a stigmatism around CTE and, and what that represents. And so to get us to be in the pinnacle of this high performing system, we have to deal with the low performing system that we created a long time ago. And we can't overlook it, even if we do change the name, we can't overlook the fact that the system itself is broken and before we can think about building it to get people to a higher achieving, they need to just achieve at the level that we put for them right now.
Yeah, thank you. I think that's 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 an important practitioner perspective, and I think and I think the idea too that you mentioned about you know how are we going to get kids ready to that tenth grade level is something we haven't really addressed in, today in conversation. There are some references in the book, and I know Vivian that some of your work in Singapore and some of your uh, recent work in China um, has has opened your eyes to some of the ways that other countries think about these equity challenges and some of the strategies that they've employed successfully and unsuccessfully to try to address some of the challenges that they face that are different than those that we face, but certainly related to Janae's point about systems that exist that are very poor and have inequities just sort of baked into the design, and also some of the, the, the biases that exist in the society. So do you, do you have any thoughts for what lessons we might glean, particularly around these equity and access issues from countries that you've studied or, or the chapters that you've contributed in the book? or? books that you've written that are on Bill Gates' favorite book list. Okay. Um, uh, well, let me just um, come at that. Mark already made some of these points, sure. but let me just come at it, um, particularly trying to address um, the issue of prestige and stigma mm. uh, and, and, and also equity. Um, and I'll, I'll talk more about Singapore than China. They're both going down the same direction. They decided they've always had vocational education, but it was low skill, low prestige, just like ours. Um, but in the 80s, Singapore, and in the uh, 2005-ish years, China, um, both countries decided they were going to make a huge commitment to vocational education and training, comparable to the commitment they make to their universities. And they did it for two reasons. One is economic. Uh, Mark's already described how Singapore looks to where it wants to go and then builds the skills so that those employers will come there. And China recognized that it's not going to be the low-skill manufacturer of the world or doesn't want to be mm -hmm. forever. And if they're going to go from made in China, meaning crap, to <laughs> made in China being as high quality as made in Japan and Korea, they really needed to work on these uh, techni technical skills. And they were quite dissatisfied with their universities, actually, which were producing very well-trained, academically trained students whom industry didn't want. They said they can't do a thing. They're just too too academic. But the, se the second thrust for both places was the equity concern mm. um, because uh, there simply was nowhere for the minority students, the three groups that are not Chinese, uh, in Singapore to go. They were in the bottom stream of a highly streamed uh, system and they, there was nowhere for them to go in, in the labor market as it was evolving. And in China you obviously have rural as, mm -hmm. as a sort of mass of people who are not being served by the current very academic system that they've developed over, over mm -hmm. 30 years. Um, but on the prestige side, Singapore is kind of interesting because when the ITEs were set up, in the, uh, the first one was in the in, 80s, the in other the oh, uh, for Institutes for Technical Education, okay. which are sort of the new thing in their technical uh, education system. ITE, jokingly, in the public uh, discourse, stood for it's the end. It's the end. <laughs> um, so, how, you know, so how do you, just because the government decides it's important doesn't mean everybody else will begin to think it's important. So a number of the things Mark touched on, I think, have been important in bringing about a change in prestige. Certainly these beautiful buildings that you walk into and you think, I'd like to study here, um, was, was a part of it. Uh, the link to economic development and employers, um, which meant that when you came out, you actually got a good job. And I think it was actually the high rates of job placement mm -hmm. out of the ITEs that, that uh, uh, turned, uh, turned people's, um, it, that eventually made the, the swing to people seeing it as prestigious and maybe a serious alternative to universities. Um, work experience, mm -hmm. I mean, I think parents were glad to see their students working in real jobs as opposed to perhaps the lower expectations they might have had about where they, uh, where they could have gone. And critically, I think, because it didn't exist in either Singapore or China, structural reform so that there was a bridge from a technical institution into a university. So now, because used to, they used to be completely separate, so one really was literally a dead end. Um, and, and now in Singapore, you can go from a technical college to a technical institute to a polytechnic to a university, and something like a quarter of the students that start off at the ITEs end <coughs> up going to university later. Mm -hmm. So I think that was very 
uh, very important. It's not, it's not that we're trying to say to Princeton, you need to offer vocational courses. Exactly. There's still the university sector there for those who want it, but there's all these other alternatives which have high academic mm -hmm. uh, standards. Um, and implications for equity. Too, and, the, right? and another thing they have also done is introduce much more serious uh, career guidance in schools, mm -hmm. not individual counselors, but curricula at the elementary, middle, and uh, high school level. Nancy, uh, Nancy talked about that as a big as a big mm -hmm. gap here, so that pe so that students from the beginning were seeing, oh, there are all these other careers over here that I didn't know about. Mm -hmm. um, so I think all of those things help to help to shift the perception, mm -hmm. um, but particularly getting a lot of good jobs. Sure. Um, and on the, on the equity front and, and get it, getting kids up to, up to high standards, um, in both Singapore and China, they will tell you they're not there yet, but in terms of you can see looking at the more developed parts of China, not the rural parts of China, and in Singapore, that the, they certainly uh, don't have as big a bottom as we do. They, mm -hmm. they manage uh, to get more students uh, up to higher levels. Um, they pay a lot of attention to early childhood. Um, and then uh, Singapore, if you, when you enter school, if you're seen as being behind or speaking a language, not speaking English well enough, which most, most students don't come into school speaking English, um, you automatically have a longer school day with tutoring uh, until you catch up. In other words, you're never allowed to fall behind. So they set the standards very high, but they give a lot of support to those who, mm -hmm. um, and it's systematic, of course, because everything, everything there is. Um, in Shanghai, they've developed a lot of interesting models in which high-performing schools are asked to help run low-performing schools. Mm -hmm. um, and that seems to be both sort of from a principal point of view and from teacher development point of view. That's seen as part of your obli social obligation if you're in a high-performing school to do that. Yes. If you're a teacher in Shanghai and you want to go to the top of the career ladder, you have to have worked in a low-performing school at some part. So, so they, they are also kind of working uh, working um, on this. Hmm. I would just say, I mean, chi China only started its big VET push around 2010, so it's too early to say. It's very similar sets of ideas. The ideas are all the same. It would be much harder to do there. It's huge. You know, uh -huh. Singapore's like some of our states. China, you could fit you know, several US's into China. Very varied economic development. Uh -huh. uh, many different levels of government. Uh, and, and big bureaucracies that don't don't communicate. So it's going to be much harder to make that uh, to make to build a system in China than uh, than in Singapore or in Maryland. I think. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, so a couple of things that you described there that I think are consistent across some of the leading systems are in the book. The first is the piece that you just mentioned about. Um, the building these systems so that they are, I think the term that we would use in the States is permeable, right? That students who start in one track and think that that, that a vocational education is what they want can, if you know, at a certain point in their career, kind of make a right turn or a left turn and, and enter a more traditional academic path and continue to sort of earn credentials um, in other, in the same field, but that might look sort of different than the applied or vocational um, credentials that they have in the you know, initial institution where they may have started their training. And that's something that you just mentioned that China is trying to figure out how to do that. Um, Singapore certainly made strides in developing that. The Swiss, of course, are sort of famous for the impossible to read maps that have lines going all <laughs> sorts of diagonal and, and same with the Germans. Um, that's something I think that you know the US might purport to have, but the pathways are certainly not clear or smooth or navigable for most people. Um, so certainly a lesson that we can pull. One thing that we've talked about, and each of you have mentioned it in a, in a very different capacity, though, is this, this question of employers, right? And so what, um, I, like, I just kind of want to leave it there and let you just respond. But <laughs> the, the, the employer culture in the US is obviously very different than in, in this, the um, uh, economies featured in the book. And it's something that we really haven't, like a nut we haven't really cracked here. And there's certainly a lot of interest, but it's kind of um, disparate. And it looks different depending on where you go. They have sort of different thresholds of cooperation with public institutions or really any other institution or systems. Um, so I'm curious whether this is a question about how to get them involved and organized. Or uh, Janae, you made the point sort of about unconscious bias and working with employers. Whether it's a question about em engaging them in sort of a system and getting them um, really to come to the table as partners in this work and open-minded partners um, that are invested in not just developing talent that they need tomorrow, but, but, but developing systems that allow them to engage with education institutions and really think about how we are as um, systems developing talent and how they're interacting with 
you know, not just the individuals, but systems, education systems. Um, are there lessons from the countries that you've all profiled or that you've seen in your work that you've t you think are most valuable for us to take back on this employer question? How do we get them to engage with education systems in developing these models in ways that are, are promising, not just for them, but for the students and the education institutions with whom they partner? Well, uh, I'll just, uh, I'll start. Uh, uh, as, I, as I said, w we uh, worked for now three years on this, uh, th this commission report. We're fortunately almost done. Uh, but <clears throat> we had, uh, as part of the effort, we had work groups uh, of commission members uh, and others that were developing the specific re recommendations. So we brought the trades, uh, the private sector, into the work groups at a very early stage to help shape the recommendations. We didn't, didn't hand them the recommendations. We got them involved in, 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 in uh, as I say, developing these. And th they, were very they were very excited. I mean, they, they were very willing partners. And, it, and at the end of the day, uh, it, we came to the conclusion that they had to be partners in the oversight of, uh, uh, it couldn't be just education. They've got to be at the table uh, in fact, the chair of the oversight board, our recommendation is, is someone from the trades or the private sector. Uh, educators are on the board, but uh, they, they uh, I think, feel ownership of this. And I, I feel that's the case because we brought them in uh, very early and uh, they helped uh, shape the final report. And they were willing. Oh, absolutely. Very enthusiastic. Yeah. Nancy? So I don't think there's a whole lot we're going to learn from other countries about how to do this. I, I think we know the lessons that, that it's absolutely critically important. But um, I think we're going to have to develop our own US version of, of employer engagement. Uh, there have been attempts in our work over many years now to get associations interested. What we have seen, and somewhat promising, is we do a lot of skills mapping mm -hmm. backward from employers. And when you have employers in a particular sector in a room and they are actually working on back mapping the skills to what's taught in a community college, they do feel like there's considerable buy-in. But how you do that on a large scale, I don't know. I mean, Jamie Dimon, for example, has sure. been a major voice for engaging employers. We've had innumerable uh, conferences, convenings, uh, there are lots of people who raise their hands, but I think there are some really tough challenges ahead. One of them, I think, is the dim view that most uh, employers have of 16-year-olds, if you're thinking about um, how you get younger people. Or those into the bottom of the list millennials. Yeah, well, that's a whole other problem. <laughs> what am I supposed to say? You're supposed to say, okay, boomer. <laughs> uh, um, <laughs> but but I, I remember being interviewed by a, somebody from a Swiss newspaper in, in New York City one day, and, and they, they simply couldn't understand why there was such a, a prejudice against 16-year-olds when mm. what makes the, the system work so well in Switzerland is that 16-year-olds are actually doing productive work. Mm -hmm. We saw 16-year-olds advising hedge fund, I was sitting next to a hedge fund advisor, or working on reviewing home loans. And the, so, so that's one big issue. So there's, we always get asked, the first questions are about confidentiality and liability, and liability. Mm -hmm. when we say we'd like to have 16-year-olds in a, in a company. In fact, OSHA says the only thing you can't do is drive a forklift. Um, so there's that set of issues, view of 16-year-olds, and then there's just this work culture. That's sure. why I'm so interested in this new phenomenon because somehow there's a disconnect between what we are asking and what employers now seem to be Wanting. ramping yes. up themselves. So how we make these connections somehow, it seems like we have to figure, yeah. figure this out in a, in a different way. I think the economy, if we hurry up before the recession <laughs> sets in, the economy will be helpful because people are really hungry right. for scrambling employees, for scrambling for talent. Yeah. But I don't have easy answers yeah. to this one. 
Um, just a couple of things. To, oh, I'm sorry. No, she looked at me, but I think she was. No, I just saw Vivian <laughs> writing, so I wanted to make sure she. I always write. <laughs> That's how I yeah. keep myself focused. Um, just a quick comment on China. China used to have really good um, uh, cooperation between VET and uh, uh, and employers because it was all part of the state-owned enterprise system. Yeah. But now that a lot of those are being dismantled, they're actually trying to take that training out. And, and mm. they don't have contact, good contacts between government and the, empl and the employees. So they have a worse problem, actually, than we do. Um, in Singapore, it's a mixture of um, the government providing incentives and insisting as a matter of policy mm. that employers who come to Singapore pay into a training fund, and then they can take funds out of it um, if, they, if they offer mm. apprenticeship opportunities. Um, but, um, but they, also, they also provide a lot of incentives to companies to come there. Sure. So they, they, it's not that the companies are just doing this of, of their, own free, their own free will. I actually think it's hard to generalize about US employees. I think you have to look at different groups because you clearly, clearly there are some that are very global. And they don't care what the local mm -hmm. labor force is. They'll pick up and move somewhere. You have others like the tech sector in California that thinks, well, we just need more HB1, 1B visas and we don't have to bother about US mm -hmm. talent because that's a much cheaper way mm -hmm. of getting people who will stay a long time. And then you have others in other states. And I think this is where the state framework is so helpful because you can actually talk to the actual employers in that state about mm -hmm. what, their, what their needs mm -hmm. are. And even US employers who go to other systems and are willing participants in it, yeah. right? And one, just on the 16-year-old point, a number of countries, Singapore is one, but in a number of the European countries, are really now starting to put some a sort of policy flesh on this idea of lifelong learning that we yeah. been, seems we've been talking about forever but don't have any real policies to incentivize by having skill credits for all employees. Um, and so, um, so that they ca the assumption is you're going to need to go back and get a particular, you know, some skill at some point. In sure. and, and that's also attractive to employers because they, then they don't have to pay for the cost of constantly reskilling right. their right. workforce. So um, we, I'm getting the sign that we're out of time here. I want to make sure that, <laughs> see if Janae has any, a comment she'd like to close us with and then I'm going to uh, try my luck to see if people are going to let us take questions. But okay. do you have a, la a last word? Oh, I'm, I'm getting just going to say we were talking about employers, just the idea of the connecting with them and the return on their investment. Mm. I think that's important. So when you look at the book, you see that connection and employers have to see what am I going to get out of this. Yep. And I think being able to invite them to the table early and actually interact with the students as well is going to help to change some of that mindset about sure. working with younger people. Sure. Yeah, and I think pushing them too to think about not just being consumers of the talent education produces, but partners in producing it, right? right. And that's that's. Um, can be sort of part of the ROI conversation, but also it requires us to kind of flip that a little bit in some ways and involve them in the production process. Um, so I don't want to cut you off. I could continue this conversation for a long time. Um, we are at 7 o'clock. I am going to wait for someone who's out here organizing to see if we can take one or two questions. Yes? OK. We, we have someone lined up. First question in the back. Um, sir, if you want to, we have a mic coming for you, but if you have a, a teacher voice. Oh, here, will you speak to the mic just so folks, thank you. What we are forgetting frequently is our money. What I mean here, and you probably know it, at least to my knowledge, Germany, Austria, Netherlands, Denmark as well, the companies are offering significant tax incentives. And that is a boost, obviously, to accept as many as possible those apprentices. That's what we might use here in the US, in which would significantly help now, the second one, maybe radical, maybe too radical, but we have those community colleges. 70% of those kids are going to work anyway. Why we not more partially those community colleges to apprenticeship? They are going to work anyway. They're basically all going to wrong work maybe. Yeah. But maybe we can realign and we will have an excellent education, two years, two and a half years, apprenticeship, and we can produce immediately excellent quality. Now, and then my comment, my comment. I'm still struggling, I'm still struggling with the comparing. United States of America and the small countries, I mean Switzerland, eight million like New York. On the other side, we have the United States of Europe. Obviously, they will never confirm that they are going in our direction. I think it would be fair to compare maybe Massachusetts to Switzerland, Denmark to mm -hmm. uh, Tennessee, whatever is it. 
and then we are looking slightly different. Yeah. Okay, so let's start with the first point, the tax incentive question. Um, Nancy, you, you, you had a, a comment right off the bat. <laughs> but we've tried it. We've tried <laughs> but I, you know, I don't think we've tried it in any really significant way. But the other thing is that Switzerland, the employers pay the wages completely. They pay a, a sum that is less than they would pay for a full-time, well-trained, entry-level worker, but they still pay the wages. There is, however, a huge investment that remains somewhat hidden of infrastructure from the mm -hmm. government and the local cantons to make it possible for all of that to happen. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't know that tax incentives, are, I mean, I only think that we are going to have either huge pressure because of the demographic shifts and the talent pipeline problems, or we're not going to get where we need to go. I, I, there are several companies, we've worked with one for years, the wonderful company in California, employers who put huge amounts of, of their own money into working with high schools and, com and community colleges, but they are a rare mm -hmm. example. They're both a philanthropy and, a, and they're in need of, of, uh, of, work, of a workforce. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't think tax incentives will do it. I was gonna say uh, on the point, oh, do you wanna stay on the tax incentives? Nope, nope, nope. Okay. go for it. So I, I think the point of looking at the state as the entity is a really good one. Because you know all these high performers, they have a single ministry of education that controls everything all across the country. Well, we have that in the state. We're never gonna have it at the national level, but we have it in each state. So I think the focus of attention should be on the states <coughs> developing uh, these, uh, these CTE programs. Yeah. And that's what we've, in our pathways work, right. that's what we've been doing right. for 10 years. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> I agree with the focus on the states, although not, so there are, a number of federal systems that are high performing uh -huh. too. Yeah. Just like Germany and Canada, certainly much more high yeah. performing than the right. US. Yeah. So they're not all small, unitary. Yeah. Uh, and most of them have decentralized from their Ministry of Education. This image that it's all driven from the top is not, is not okay. true anymore. Yeah. I think we, we have time for one more question over here, unless Janae, you wanted to get a word in? No? Okay, one more question, and then I know we've got folks who have to scramble to the airport, so. <laughs> Oh. Thank you, and it'll be quick. Um, question for Bill. Um, first of all, just so I don't misstate what your, the goal that you put forth. Did you say something like the goal should be 40% of high school? Right. Could you characterize it, just so I don't misstate it? Oh, so, so the, 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 the target in our uh, re report is that 40% of uh, the college and career ready students would follow the uh, so career and uh, technical education pathway. That seems to cannibalize the uh, community that is aiming for college. Janae made what I think was a critical point about that, when people are shooting for that for however long. Instead of 40% of that group being the target, why not make the target be 80 or 90% of those who don't opt for college? Well, uh, basically it is because the other two tracks are other two pathways are uh, early co early college, and the and the um, uh, advanced placement baccalaureate uh, uh, national baccalaureate. So, uh, you know, two thirds of the uh, students are headed towards a, a, a college track, and many of the ones on the career and technical ed education will also be taking right. college courses because right. they've met the college and career ready standard. So on that. Yes. Yeah. So I, I, we could go on, and I know that there are other questions, but we are over time in there. Um, we will not be the ones to stand between you and the bar. But if you could just join me um, in thanking our panel, and also j thanking Mark and NCEE for bringing us together. Thank you. Don't be late for that birthday.
just want to thank everyone for coming and please invite you to have